Mehmed II, conqueror of Constantinople, is remembered as one of the greatest warrior sultans of the Ottoman Empire. But the greatest leaders often leave behind empires in turmoil, and Mehmet was no exception. With his death, the Ottoman Empire would be plunged into civil war and left at its weakest since Timur's victory at Ankara. Today on Kings and Generals, we shall explore the life of his son, Jem Sultan, a prince, a rebel, an adventurer, and a hostage. Today's video is sponsored by Babbel, the number one language learning app in the world. For a historical channel, knowing the language of the sources used in the videos is extremely helpful, and as we're planning a series on the history of Russia, we decided that we need a refresher to be able to read the works of Russian authors. As it's impossible to work with a tutor right now, we decided to try Babbel, and that was a great experience. Unlike other language learning apps, Babbel is ad-free. It teaches a language for real life, and with Babbel you can count on learning from people who have actual experience teaching languages. Studies have shown that just 15 hours of learning with Babbel is an equivalent of a semester in college. Babbel has well-structured courses teaching 13 languages, and are great if you want to learn a new language or are looking for self-improvement. So what are you waiting for? Support us and click the link in the description below right now to get 50% off Babbel for 6 months for a limited time only. Jem Sultan was born in Erdine on December 22, 1459, six years after his father's conquest of Constantinople. As Mehmed already had two sons, Bayezid and Mustafa, the arrival of a third and the question of succession greatly upset him. The great Sultan even kicked his infant son's cradle in rage, with the ensuing fall possibly causing the squint Jem would be noted for throughout his life. Still, Jem was brought up with all of the honours of a prince, quickly growing to be a favourite of his father and the Ottoman court. During Jem's early childhood, the Ottomans were far from secure in their power, with powerful enemies to the west, east and south. To the west, the Venetians, Hungarians and Albanians fought to resist Ottoman conquest and retaliated in the form of crusades. To the east, their powerful Karamanid Beylik remained a rival for dominance of Anatolia. Even after falling under nominal Ottoman vassalage in 1463, the Karamanids retained great power within their South Anatolian domain, launching several rebellions backed by the Mamluks of Egypt. But by 1466, Mehmed felt secure enough to turn back to conquering Albania. Back in Anatolia, 1468 would see the eight-year-old Jem given his first governorship in Kastamonu. Accompanied by his mother and two guardians, he was raised for rulership, receiving an education in Persian, Arabic, poetry and the sciences. As the years passed, Jem came closer to the throne. As his eldest brother Bayezid had developed an addiction to opium, greatly enraging Mehmet. There was also the Byzantine concept of porphyrogenitus to consider. As Jem was the only son born while Mehmet was the reigning sultan, he would be the legitimate heir under the succession laws of the Eastern Roman Empire, a fact Jem would later use to strengthen his claim. Soon it was clear to everyone that the charismatic and popular Jem was becoming the favourite for succession over the gloomy Bayezid. In 1472 and 1473, he was even allowed to serve as regent, while his father and brothers were campaigning against the Akayunlu. When 40 days passed with no word of their whereabouts, rumours of Mehmed's demise even led the 12-year-old Jem to be crowned as Sultan. News arrived shortly after that his father had in fact been victorious at Osluk Beli, and that caused Jem to flee back to Kastamonu before Mehmed's triumphant return to Constantinople. But Mehmed made no attempt to punish Jem for this episode, and as Mustafa died of illness the next year, the stage was set for a succession showdown between Jem and Bayezid. This struggle would begin on the 3rd of May 1481, with Mehmed's death near Gebza. Despite the best efforts of Grand Vizier Karamanli Mehmed Pasha, a supporter of Jem, News of the Sultan's death spread quickly to the Venetians, and then through them to the rest of Christian Europe, causing much rejoicing. But the most important question was which of Mehmet's two sons, each occupied with their provincial governorships, 
would receive the news first. Karamanli Mehmet had immediately sent three fast riders to Konya, where Jem had served as governor since Mustafa's death, to give him a head start to Constantinople. But Bela Bey of Anatolia and supporter of Bayezid, Sinan Pasha, created checkpoints on all the roads leading to Konya, intercepting the messengers. Meanwhile, his own messenger brought the same news to Bayezid in Emasa. In Emasya. Kasim Aga, commander of the Janissaries loyal to Bayezid, had his troops storm Topkapi Palace and execute Karamanli Mehmet, parading his head through the streets on a pike. On May 20th, Bayezid entered Constantinople and was enthroned as Bayezid II. Jem had lost the race to Constantinople. But rather than accept this, he decided to fight. Jem portrayed himself as a people sultan, who would end the oppression and taxation of the central state over the provinces, attracting the support of the Karamanids, local craft guilds, and minority religious sects such as the Alevi Shia. With his army of volunteers, he marched to the former Ottoman capital Bursa, where the garrison joined his ranks. Now boasting a strength of some 20,000, he sent his brother an offer. They would split the Ottoman Empire, with Bayezid to rule its European provinces from Constantinople, while Jem ruled Anatolia from Bursa. Fortified as he was in Bursa, and with Bayezid facing Janissary mutiny, Jem hoped his brother would accept this ultimatum rather than risk battle. But Bayezid's response was clear. Between kings, there can be no kinship. On the 22nd of June, Bayezid and his army of 40,000 regulars arrived at Bursa. Rather than wait out a siege, Jem chose to ride out and meet him. But by noon, Jem's untrained and outnumbered army was routing, and what regular forces he had were defecting to Bayezid. After only 20 days, Jem's rule in Bursa had met its end. With his family and some 40 loyal followers, he fled, escaping the pursuing army and beginning his new life in exile. After a three-day stay in Konya, Jem left the empire to take sanctuary with his father's enemy, the Mamluk Sultan Kate Bey. Kate Bey's lavish welcome helped him keep his ambitions undiminished, and he hoped that with the backing of the Mamluks, he would be able to raise another army and oust Bayezid from Anatolia. He refused Bayezid's offer of a generous pension to live out his life in Jerusalem. After a six-month stay in the Mamluk Empire, during which he became the first Ottoman prince to perform the Hajj to Mecca, Jem set out again for Anatolia with 60,000 gold coins from Kate Bey's treasury and thousands of soldiers from Mamluk Syria. By the 6th of May 1482, he had gathered his forces in Aleppo and shortly after continued to Konya, joined by both the Bey of Karaman, Qasim Bey, and the governor of Ankara, Mehmet Aga. With their support, Jem now had a stronger force than before. But Bayezid had not been idle either, and as Jem was besieging Konya, the Sultan gathered more than 100,000 troops to crush his brother. Bayezid did have reason to distrust his army's loyalty though. Jem was popular, as was Mehmet Aga among the Janissaries, and several waves of defections had struck him already. As long as the two remained united, they would pose a serious threat even to his numerically superior forces. But opportunity struck when Mehmet Aga broke off from the siege of Konya to return to Ankara for his family. On the way, he was intercepted and defeated by an Ottoman detachment, his head sent as a trophy to Bayezid. When news of that and of the massive army approaching Konya were spread, morale broke and Jem's army melted away without battle. For the second time, Jem was defeated and powerless, fleeing the wrath of his victorious brother, this time to the highlands of Pisidia, where he and Qasim Bey planned their next move. With the pursuers cutting them off from returning to Kate Bey, Jem suggested fleeing to the Akayunlu, but Qasim Bey suggested instead turning to the Christian princes of Europe. Jem agreed, making a decision that would greatly impact European history. Evading Bayezid's troops, Jem rode for the Cilician coast to seek the protection of the Knights Hospitaller of Rhodes. Transferred from a Caramanian galley to a Rhodian flotilla, 
Jem made a striking impression with his grace and manners. By July 29th, Jem was in the castle of Rhodes, guest of the master of the order, Pierre de Busson. Jem developed a deep respect for Pierre as the two came to know each other. In Rhodes, Jem sought to win the backing of the Christian princes to help him take the Ottoman throne. Over the past decades, as his father penetrated ever deeper into Europe, even taking Otranto in southern Italy meant to be the staging ground for a grand conquest of the peninsula, alarm had grown and calls for crusade had been raised. Jem hoped to make use of this, promising to forge an eternal peace with Europe and return all conquered Christian lands if he was brought to power. Unfortunately for Jem, the pragmatic d'Orbesson knew that the political climate in Europe was not a harmonious one. With the threat of Mehmed lifted, Italian states, including the papacy, were locked in incessant war with each other, as were the Holy Roman Empire and the Kingdom of Hungary under Matthias Corvinus, the Ottomans' fiercest European rival. De Boussin surmised that a crusade was unlikely, and that negotiation with Bayezid was more practical. Thus, though the agreement between Jem and the Hospitala leader guaranteed Jem freedom of movement, Dobisar was already securing concessions from Bayezid, a peace treaty, the return of fortresses, and most significantly, a yearly stipend of 40,000 ducats in exchange for keeping Jem safely under control and out of Ottoman politics. As quickly as Jem had put his faith in the Hospitalers, he had been betrayed. From the moment he entrusted himself into their care, the mighty prince had become a prisoner. On October 17th, Jem was taken to Nice, then part of the French-dominated Duchy of Savoy. Word had spread of Jem's presence with the knights, with many other Christian monarchs taking an avid interest in the prince. During the trip to Nice, and during their stops in Syracuse and Messina, they were dogged by spies of King Ferrante of Naples, who had been fighting intermittent wars with Venice and the Pope, and hoped to win an alliance with Bayezid. Upon Jem's landing in Nice, and being set up in the safety of one of the knight's commanderies there, the scramble only intensified. The prince was told by the knights that the delay in Nice was while they awaited permission from the king, Louis XI of France, for a Muslim to travel through his country. Later, as Jem's impatience and suspicion grew, he was told that Louis had refused the request. This was a lie. Louis had in fact been eager to meet Jem, but the knights kept Jem on a tight leash in Nice. When Jem sent his retainer, Nasu Bey, to accompany a knightly envoy to Louis, he was quickly arrested as a spy and never reached Paris. Other messengers Jem sent, trying to get in contact with Kate Bey and his other allies in Asia, simply vanished from the historical record. Whether they were captured by the knights, by Bayezid, or simply abandoned their defeated prince's cause is unknown. None of the messengers sent by Jem from Nice seem to have reached their destinations. Despite his captivity though, Jem seems to have been quite happy in Nice. Poetry he wrote during this period expresses his fascination with the local customs and the beauty of local women. Many stories have sprung up about the dashing Turkish prince, usually revolving around heartbreak and romance one of the more colourful ones, suggesting that the courtesans of Nice were so sad to see him go that they presented him with a talking white parrot and a chess-playing chimpanzee, who would comfort him for the rest of his days. Jem would not be long in this gilded cage, however, and was moved after a few short months from Nice to Rosh Hashanah, where local legend says he fathered a child with the daughter of a local noble, Philippine. From there he was moved in early 1484 to Bourganeuf, and then Bois-Lamy, where he would spend two years. From Bois-Lamy we get the story of La Dame Elle Lincon, a young woman named Jeanne, another noble daughter, who was also said to have had an affair with Jem. Finally he was moved back to a tower in Bourganeuf, built by the knights expressly to hold their valuable prisoner. There was reason for this heightened security. Numerous monarchs across the Christian world and beyond had taken an interest in the knights' prize. Some, such as King Ferrante of Naples and Doge of Venice Giovanni Mocenigo, 
sought to win a closer relationship with Bayezid by using Jem as a pawn. Others, such as Matthias Corvinus and Pope Innocent VIII, had not lost hope that a crusade might be launched against the Ottomans, with Jem as its figurehead. The Mamluk Sultan Kate Bey offered to pay 20,000 ducats for the knights to return Jem to his care. Dobison accepted the money, but reneged on releasing Jem. The young Duke Charles of Savoy even attempted to free Jem, not for profit or crusade, but in honour of the friendship the two had formed when Charles came to visit this exotic prisoner in his lands. But all was for naught. The tower kept Jem securely imprisoned through both rescue and assassination attempts, as Bayezid seethed and the chance for a crusade slipped ever further away. The final step in Jem's long journey would be Rome itself. In 1488, Innocent managed to secure Jem after long negotiations with King Charles VIII of France by making the Archbishop of Bordeaux a cardinal, undercutting the efforts of an extravagant Hungarian embassy competing for custody of Jem. Jem would live out most of his remaining captivity in the Vatican. By this point, both Jem's grand plans to retake the throne and Innocent's hopes of crusade now seemed distant. Poetry Jem wrote in Rome and the accounts of his main chronicler, Sedudin, show the once charismatic prince grow morose and regretful. Refusing attempts to convert him to Christianity, and despairing of ever winning the Ottoman throne, he begged simply to be allowed to return to a Muslim nation and live out his days peacefully as Bayezid had once offered. But it was far too late for such a life now. To innocent he was too valuable, and to Bayezid too dangerous. 1490 would see both rulers attempt to end the long stalemate. Bayezid sent Cristoforo Castracano, a renegade Italian nobleman, to assassinate Innocent and Jem by poisoning the Vatican's main well, but the plot was uncovered and foiled by the Venetians. Innocent, on March 25th, convened a council before delegates of every Christian nation, seeking to finally start the crusade both he and Sixtus had hoped to make a reality. But the death of Matthias Corvinus disrupted both the Council and the European balance of power, with the Council's planned reconvention never occurring. As Dubisson had before, Innocent decided to instead profit by negotiation with Bayezid, receiving 120,000 ducats up front and 40,000 more yearly for Jem's upkeep. Rather ironically for a Pope so set on the idea of crusade, Innocent even refused Kate Bey's offer of Jerusalem and its environs in exchange for returning Jem to Cairo. In 1492, Innocent passed away as well, with his body now resting in a bronze tomb constructed with funds from Bayezid's upkeep payments. Alexander VI, a nepotistic scion of the Borgia clan with at least eight children, replaced him as both pontiff and as Jem's jailer. Jem's last few years of life were defined by the grand ambitions of another royal, King Charles VIII of France, who in 1494 invaded Italy on the basis of his dynastic claim to Naples. King Ferrante, who had dogged Jem's footsteps a decade prior, had died early the same year, leaving his untested son Alfonso to weather the French onslaught. But Charles planned for more than the conquest of Naples. He saw in himself a second Charlemagne, who would reclaim Constantinople and the Holy Land. For this purpose, as his army passed through the Papal lands, Alexander turned Jem over into the king's care. After his long exile, Jem was finally in the hands of a powerful Christian monarch, as he had planned. For the first time in a decade, the prince had hope. But Jem would accompany Charles no further than Naples. By the time the French army seized Capua on February 18th, Jem was laid so low by illness that he needed to be carried on a stretcher. The French blamed Pope Alexander, claiming that the pontiff had given Jem a slow-acting poison in Rome. But as Jem's loyal food taster, Ayas Bey, had accompanied him every step, and as Jem's death deprived Pope Alexander of the 40,000 ducats flowing yearly into the papal coffers, this charge seems unlikely. Others suspected Bayezid, but by illness or poison, 
Jem Sultan died on February 25th, accompanied by the companions that had followed him so faithfully throughout unfriendly foreign lands. He was 35 years old. We're planning more videos on Ottoman history from army composition to administration, culture and religion, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters and channel members who make the creation of our videos possible. Now you can also support us by buying our merchandise via the link in the description. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.